thank you very much, um, Colma. Just to say to you that we had hoped to have child and adolescent mental health services with us today. Um, they're not here, and I think it's fair to say IPPN is very disappointed that that's the case, so read into that what you will. Um, you will have noticed, I'm sure, that we are a little bit over time, so what we're going to do is add a bit on to the end of the day. I hope that's okay with you. Obviously, you're free to leave at half three if you need to, but I just think it's important to do our question and answer session properly. So we're going to spend another couple of minutes before lunch, and then I promise you a delicious lunch awaits. So we are going to invite two more people to join our panel for questions and answers. First, we have Monica Hawhey, who's lead clinical con consult with uh, Care Call. Monica, you're very welcome. You can make your way up to your, your seat here. And then a late addition, and we're very glad that Joan has agreed to do this, Joan Murphy, uh, HSE Healthy School Coordinator. You're welcome, Joan. Thank you for joining us. <laughs> Take a seat there, Joan. Um, So CAMs aren't here, um, and normal, normally the rules are that if somebody's not here, you can't really talk about them. But anyway, we are going to. So, <laughs> um, and, and Gordon, this is one for you. Um, should CAMs be part of TUSLA? They're not at the moment, as many people here will know. Uh, out of character, I'm going to duck that question a little bit but by, by saying there needs to be a debate about this, and the present structure is not correct. You know, having been uh, first director for children's services, beware of the false god of integration. You always need some boundaries in order that services are organised. So you could take CAM services and move them into the child and family agency and then you would have a difficult boundary with the actual health service with the psychiatric side of the house. You know, so uh, sometimes I have seen the best multidisciplinary work even although there are multiple accountabilities it is managing to call people to the table. It's managing to get a service when it's there. It's being more responsive. Ireland has a major problem with consistency of the resource allocation, which we're all fighting for um, and recovering from. Ireland has done really well, well on the basis of ground up local initiatives. It's now time to harvest those initiatives into something which is more strategic because your capacity to access a CAM service in Mayo will be far greater than in South Dublin for no particular reason. And you can apply the same to child protection or other things. Yes, yes. You know, so, so are the current arrangements correct? No. Could there be a case made that it should be part of a broader children's agency? Absolutely yes. I think there needs to be further debate. If the focus is primarily on well-being and working with the universal services, health and education. Yes, it should be. Not only should we be more resourced in depth, but I do think that if Ireland is to have the high quality child and family agency it deserves, the base should be broader, early years, youth, youth services, single point of contact, not just the elastoplast services of protection and welfare. Okay, thank you for that. Um, Monique, we've heard a lot today about patchy service. That, that some of the services are working really well in certain places and not in other areas. How does that sit with you or what's your view on it coming from, from where you're coming from? Well, I work with Care Call and it's a service that's there for the teachers themselves and to promote well-being among the teachers. And there's very high take-up with the teachers and generally teachers that do come to our service aren't actually talking about the work but about themselves and their lives and that's generally what affects people's mental health and well-being. So. The teachers that have come to us have been very positive in their feedback and uh, so I feel that that's an important contribution to the conference around the well-being in but schools. But is, is the struggle to provide um, services and support to students yeah. not playing into part of the difficulties that teachers experience when they come to you? And that I'm sure is the case but teachers come to us about their lives and their generally their personal issues and their relationships and their stresses and financial worries but you know so I I'm, I'm not in a position to say that teachers are coming to say to us about being under-resourced. No, they come about themselves and their well-being and how they can manage their stress, mm -hmm. really. And maybe some of that is... I'm sure that some of it is to do with the resources, but they're coming to us about their lives. Okay, and so that perhaps one of the important things for you to say today is when we're talking about emotional well-being is that your service is there Absolutely. And, and come and use it. Absolutely, yes. I think it's a very important aspect of emotional well-being and if teachers and principals can model that uh, valuing of their own well-being 
it will pass on to the pupils and the students. Okay, um, Suzanne, now we were kind of working on a plan at the beginning of the day when we were saying that some of the evaluation work that was being, doing might, being done might feed into coming up with a model for a, a well-run emotionally well school, if you like, mm. and you seem to feed into that as well because your project, you were mm. saying, might just identify some schools doing it really well. But why not evaluate this in the way that we evaluate academics and other areas when it comes to the inspectorate? Okay, I'm, I'm not actually going to take a position that says we would never evaluate it because I don't know that yet. We're still in learning mode. But what I would say is that I share with Pat a sense that actually, and, and the schools that we've worked with, we're learning this from them as well, that actually well-being isn't a package or an entity in and of itself which exists independently of the school community. It's intricately and intimately connected to the quality of relationships established in the community. And sometimes, relation, you know, I'm not sure that relationships are amenable um, to um, quantification and measurement in the same way that other aspects of provision might be through inspection. That doesn't mean, however, that it shouldn't be evaluated. If we think of the word value in the middle of evaluated, I think it's really important, and earlier speakers have emphasized this, that we model the value, we, we, we witness to the value we place on the well-being of everyone in the school community. And Clive spoke earlier about, I suppose, really um, the tyranny of a system which values things which are measurable and quantifiable in terms of, for example, um, points or grades that might be achieved. And you could say the same if you were talking about a, an inspection regime which had tick marks and mm -hmm. graded. Um, I'm speaking really about that notion of, in some way, it is incumbent on us to witness to the fact that we value the quality of relationships in schools, the structures we put in place to teach ourselves and the children we work with how to relate to one another in a respectful and enabling way. And maybe that's properly the evaluative space of school self-evaluation. But, but maybe the, that's really where it's. The main it's thing it's. is that you're starting on this process yeah. yourself and, and, and you're going mm. through it, which is, which is good, because that seems to be where everybody mm. is. Um, Joan, the HSE Healthy Schools uh, project that's what you're you're coordinating yes are a lot of schools involved in that are you looking for schools to get involved what do they get out of it what do they need to do well the health promoting school program has been up and running here in Ireland in, in with the new national framework since 2012 and we've had a tremendous response from schools it very much looks at health from a holistic point of view not just focusing on one aspect and it looks at the whole school community in relation to their health and well-being and I suppose the thing about the Health Promoting School is that it's planning for health in a coordinated way and we have key structures and key action areas for working with schools. So whether it's around the environment, around policies, partnerships, or working with the whole school community, it is a very, it's an evidence-based international programme that has been shown to improve health and well-being in schools. Okay, um, yeah. questions from the floor then, as we rapidly hurtle towards lunchtime. A raised hand anywhere. Okay, over on this side, my left, we'll get a microphone to you. And we'll keep our questions brief so we can get as many of them in as possible before it's, we need to break. It's, it's more a statement than a question, but... Okay, a short one, I hope. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. We have health, health promoting schools, green schools, active schools, digital schools. There's only one project that any school would be able to take on in a year. We are very overloaded, and while I appreciate and I very much value the, uh, the need for a well-being in schools. I would put it as priority, but we are very overloaded. Okay. Would anybody like to... I, I think that's a very fair point. Thank you. Um, I have two sisters who are teachers, and I know how overloaded you are, so I think that's a very fair point. Mm. Would anybody like to take that on or speak to it? Or to well, I just, Joan? Just maybe to say about the Health Promoting School, it does, it's, a, it's for all members of the school community, and that very much puts teachers and the staff as a core part of the school community. And it's one of the most, of, I suppose, evidence-based programme that says, this is your time. It gives you an opportunity to say, well, how well is my workplace supporting me to be healthy? How well am I supported in my own professional development? How well am I supported if I run up against um, 
a difficulty in the classroom and do I get support um, from my colleagues, do I get support from my principal or where do I need to get support. So it gives a, it gives a focus for schools and for staff as well, the Health Mode School is specifically for staff as well. Gordon, you want to say something else? Uh, one brief point about the point about staff welfare. I do think we underestimate that at our cost. My Dunblane experience would be that those who contributed most effectively, it wasn't a function of their professionalism or their past practice, it was about their hinterland, it was about their support. If they had a crack, if they had a recent bereavement, a recent divorce, something in their life, they, they, as like as not, they were the staff in that high pressure crisis situation who went under. So for school principals to know and nurture and be conscious of staff welfare is important. With regards to the list of initiatives, yes, absolutely amen to that, but it is the job of us as leaders to grab all that and simplify the agenda and reduce the agenda and see the connections and to get the focus on the core values of the school. Suzanne, you're nodding in agreement there. Yeah. Um, it I, I, I actually appreciate exactly where you're coming from, that notion of the, the plethora of initiatives. I tried to capture just a few of them on one slide. I could have used three slides. But I think what's, what the message that we're learning from schools is that actually well-being isn't something that's added on and it's not something new. It's something that has been knit into the fabric of how schools understand themselves and their role for a very long time. And perhaps what, what we need to do is actually just surface consciousness of that. And this focuses attention not on some, a new way of being, but actually seeing the way we are and, one, and making that better. So rather, you know, rather than an add-on. You're all off the hook because I have to break for lunch. We have a set time for lunch and we've got to do it. We'll see you back here at about... Quarter past, quarter past two. So enjoy your hour and we'll see you back here then. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot.